uh, het doet mij deugd oh. dat er uh, bij deze trip, trip through memory, memory lane toch een aantal mensen zonder grijze haren zitten. <laughs> en uh, ik denk dat dat alleen maar, alleen maar goed is. En, uh, ja, uh, Bob van der Akker, uh, hij is... Uh, directeur en oprichter van het uh, Home Computer Museum. Ik heb altijd bij computermusea zo, zo het gevoel van... Uh, wat ik niet bij andere musea heb. Van, ik was hierbij. Ik heb dit ding, daar heb ik iets mee gedaan. Daar heb ik, hè, uh, ik heb nooit naast Picasso gestaan, maar ik heb wel op een pet getypt. En ja, dat, 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 geeft, dat geeft een extra... Extra swing aan, uh, aan het geheel. Uh, en uh, ja, nog, nog een kleine anekdote. Ik zag dat je een uh, Silicon Graphics machine mee, mee had genomen. Yep. Een kleine anekdote daar, uh, daarbij. Ik heb bij Silicon Graphics gewerkt. Hoe was jij dat? Ja, ik was, ik, was, ik was die ene, ja. Maar wel in, in, de, in, de, in de tijd dat Silicon Graphics nog Silicon Graphics was. Dus een ja. grote club in, uh, in Mountain View, Californië. En in datzelfde gebouw, waar toen het headquarters van Silicon Graphics is, is nu het uh, Computer History Museum. Ja. En dat, uh, dat geeft ook wel een uh, leuke, uh, ja, leuke relatie. En ik, ik, heb, ik heb dus die, die Onyx, Onyx 2 machines, uh, heb ik meegewerkt. Nou, ga ik toch even snel, want het hoort niet bij deze presentatie, nee. maar die Silicon Graphics die we bij hebben, waarvan de voeding kapot is, dus als jij er gewerkt hebt, kun je die fixen. Uh, nee. uh, nou, Vervolgens... m- misschien kan ik nog wel aan de voeding komen. Ja, die kunnen wij zelf waarschijnlijk ook fixen, uh, maar okay. dankjewel. Nou, uh, uh, nee, maar even, even is nog, uh, die hoort hier niet bij de presentatie, maar die heb ik mee, meegenomen. Uh, wij hebben namelijk vier, uh, twee Silicon Graphics Indigo 2's uh, in de paarse versie, de R10.000, en we hebben ook de groene versie. Dat zijn vier machines, en de vorige eigenaar daarvan was Tom Roosendaal. En uh, Ton Roosendaal, die komt uit Nune, daarom hebben wij hem, omdat Nune ligt naast Helmond. Uh, en op deze computer is een van de vier computers waar Ton Roosendaal dus Blender op heeft gemaakt. Dit is serieus de eerste computer waar Blender op heeft gestaan. Um, en nou is de voeding kapot, dus ja, dat moeten we dan fixen. Maar daarom heb ik die meegenomen, ik denk dat lijkt me nou een leuk verhaal om te vertellen, maar dat... Weet nou, nou, nou weten jullie dat, maar de rest weet dat. Je had het bordje kunnen lezen, staat ook op. Ik doe mijn presentatie overigens in Engels, ik weet niet of dat een probleem is. En zo niet, ja, dan moet je straks maar de ondertiteling lezen. Um, so, um, I'll start. Um, yeah, as, uh, my name is Bart van der Akker, I'm the founder and uh, the current CEO of the Home Computer Museum. Uh, the Home Computer Museum is created in 2018 and we preserve the history of the home computer or all computers related to this home computer. And since 2020 we also collect Dutch computers. So in case you're wondering if you ever visit us, uh, we have a few computers that are not home computers but then they are, they, these are either related to the home computer, like an Apple Lisa for example that's actually related to the home computer, but also the Dutch computer like Holborn uh, which are really odd looking computers. Uh, but they are not home computers but they are Dutch history, therefore we collect them. Um, But first, I'll, I'll tell something about myself, because uh, that's the boring part, and then we do that in the beginning, that everybody can forget it. So, uh, that's me. Apparently, I was born in 1982. Before that, I wasn't named Bart van der Akker yet. Um, and this is me in six pictures. That's, that's the only thing I can say. I play drums, that's my drum kit. I play guitar sometimes. Uh, I have too many guitars. I have a big V8, because... I don't like electric cars. Um, the Home Computer Museum, uh, I do love watching movies and series, and I especially like Weird Al Yankovic, in case somebody knows them. Uh, this is my family, my, uh, my beautiful wife and my two children, and uh, I have a love for Linux as well. However, um, I talked with my therapist, and I talked with my family and my friends, and they all said, you should tell him, you really should, because I'm a Windows user. Sorry for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> But it wasn't always the case. Uh, this is my uh, c- computer uh, room back in around 2000. Uh, this is where I started my uh, computer career. And um, on 2000, I started with Linux Red Hat 5.2. I actually got a computer from 
a, a, a dump, I found a Pentium 100, and for some reason I decided to install Linux Red Hat 5.2, which I can tell you is a really shit thing to install. But so I, re I went quickly to Red Hat 6.2 because that was way more comfortable to install. Uh, and I created my own web server on that, and it was doing DNS, it was gateway, it was dial-up internet back then, uh, at least in uh, the, the little village I lived in. Um, and we had, I, I used this computer to dial-up to the internet, so if somebody wanted to go on the internet, this Linux machine would automatically dial-up. Later we had uh, cable, and uh, with that we had 60k upload speed, so that was plenty of, uh, enough for a website. And the website was World of Real Yankovic, which still exists today. Uh, it's a website about Weird Al Yankovic, because nobody in Netherlands liked Weird Al Yankovic, and so I needed to start a website for that. Um, I worked at that time at Hitronix. Uh, I was um, put in uh, Philips um, Semiconductors, which is now called NXP, and I created, um, against all odds, I created there an intranet, uh, which was based on uh, Linux. I think it was Debian. I'm not sure anymore. Um, I was still studying, and uh, and... I found this one, Michael. <laughs> this is what we created together. Uh, Michael Bulle, uh, we were together in, in school and uh, we, did, we were the Linux guys together. And uh, this is about how you can dial up on the internet using Linux. So that was kind of fun. I found this in my, yeah, you're, you're talking with a museum, so I, I kind of save things now. Um, so that's the. So 2002, I went to a KDE on Red Hat 7.2. Uh, at work, I used Gen 2. Yes, we had a business. Uh, I worked at a company that used Gen 2 as their main operating system. Uh, and I can tell you, I've done a lot of compiling just for Gen 2. Um, and uh, yeah, I also had uh, Debian. We had one server, Debian, uh, which the server actually there on the bottom is actually in the museum right now because the previous owner gave that computer to us and it's running now in the museum. So the original computer I worked on is still in the museum. Um, 2004, I did, uh, you know, I like to punish myself, so I started to run Gen 2 as my main operating system. Compiling KDE on a Pentium 350 megahertz is not fun. Um, at work, I did a QMail database. I did a lot of things in that. I built a huge uh, server using L Director D and uh, Heartbeat, uh, a big website which did a few terabytes a day. Um, so I built that entirely. And unfortunately, I had to do a Windows Server as well. But uh, yeah, not for long because I killed it and I put Zarafa on it. I did in one day, uh, one night actually, uh, I migrated the entire Windows Server out of the building and uh, the next day everybody was working just as expected, ev except everything was running on open source software, Sarafa in this case. Um, so 2008 I went to Ubuntu, uh, my work is uh, CentOS and I started to learn asterisk. Um, that's what I did in most of uh, the time, uh, doing uh, asterisk stuff, so, uh, compiling, creating my own, uh, or not my own, but uh, doing uh, voice over IP. So I also went to, um, to another company, Clearfox, which I built uh, this operating system, and uh, which was a Linux-based uh, CentOS machine, and there was an asterisk uh, back-end uh, voice over IP, and there was a front-end, which I completely programmed. Um, and I had my own colo at that point, Debian. And as you could see, the first computers, which were not Linux anymore, at my home. So eventually, in 2018, I started the Home Computer Museum. And in the Home Computer Museum, uh, I tried to do, use GNOME for a while, but eventually I had to go to Windows for multiple reasons, uh, which I'm still using today. Uh, unfortunately, because I really want to go back to uh, Linux, but yeah, I can't simply because a lot of things I, I can only work on Windows. So the Home Computer Museum, 2018. Um, yeah, I just already explained it what we do. Um, so why not let LGR? Maybe you know it from uh, YouTube. He created this uh, lovely. Uh, well, he spoke in this video, and uh, it's uh, one and a half minutes. So. Enjoy. Welcome to the Home Computer Museum, an interactive museum with over a thousand square meters of nostalgia. From well-known to lesser-known brands, discover the unique stories behind each computer. What makes our museum rather special is that all of the items in our collection can be touched and used. 
discover or rediscover old operating systems, or play games in our arcade cafe. The Home Computer Museum offers entertainment for young and old. One of the goals of the founder of the Home Computer Museum is to help people with a distance from the labor market. Most of our volunteers have a distance from the labor market because of autism, and we work together with various parties to offer daytime activities and reintegration. All of this in a stress-free environment. The Home Computer Museum is more than just a museum. We offer various services in our specialized workshop, such as repair services, data recovery and destruction, museum quality refurbishing, or appraisal of your computer. Companies and individuals alike are welcome to contact us. Whether you come in as a visitor, customer, or volunteer, feel welcome at the Home Computer Museum. That's us. Um, so essentially, this is the business we built. Well. I originally built, but I'm calling everything now we because it's a group effort. We have currently six board members and 45 volunteers, so it's a we now. Um, the Home Computer Museum is built basically uh, what I call on the four pillars. Uh, four pillars that make this a company, uh, allowing us to be uh, existing without any subsidy and, uh, of course, with help with sponsors, but it's not the only thing we do. Um, so the museum part is the most important part. And uh, what we have uh, seen, especially in 2020, when this museum part completely fell off because we didn't have a museum, we couldn't do with anything with the museum. But we kept on running because we have these other pillars still standing. And that's why we ke kept our museum up and running. Um, and uh, well, the museum part is the most Im important, so let's play a game. I I'll show you a few pictures. and. Um, if you can find your home computer in there, or your first computer, uh, please raise your hand. I'm, I'm interested in that. So, yay. <laughs> okay, next. Yay. Next. See, yeah, all right, cool, cool. Okay, this is for the elderly. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, the Altair is over there. These are all pictures of the Home Computer Museum, by the way. These are all systems we actually have. Um, but as you can see, we have uh, this is just a small portion of the computers we have, because uh, these are all the brands we have. Uh, we currently have uh, over 1,200 unique computer systems. In total, we have over 2,000 uh, computers in the, in the museum. And if you calculate all the objects we have, including documentation, uh, monitors, disk drives, um, printers, everything you can imagine, we are way over the 20,000 items at this moment. Well, actually, it's now more like 21,000 because every day we get stuff in. Um, so yeah, that's a lot. Um, and that's also one of the things we, we find important, because the home, the, the, the home computer, the computer that can be used at home, is something that exists for 50 years, almost. Since 1975, you can debate on that if the Altair 8800 is the very first one. But um, let's say for, for the ease, the Altair 8800 is the very first home computer. So we're talking about 50 years of computer history. And uh, what we have nowadays, we have mobile phones, we have televisions, we have refrigerators, which are computers by itself. And it's all because of this start 50 years ago. And um, many people ask, so how a computer museum, why do you have a computer museum? Well, it's a very fast growth in how computers were used. I mean, we started out with uh, the Commodore 64. Most of people started with the Commodore 64 or playing a cassette, or using a cassette and loading in, waiting for 20 minutes just to load a game. And uh, because people were annoyed by that, they started to improve it and they started to make it better and, and adding disk drives, make disk drives cheaper and creating more and more in, that we still have um, today that you have a mobile phone and you press with your finger just on the screen and you have instantly the information you want. And it's only getting faster and faster. And that's the importance of the Home Computer Museum. We, we keep this history, and we especially keep the growth of the 
how the computers were evolved in those time. Especially in the beginning, people were having nothing and they have to invent something. And um, you still see that, but right now it's more on AI and it's more software based, but in the past it was hardware based. As the Home Computer Museum, uh, we, only, we don't collect uh, stories, or we don't collect the hardware alone, because collecting hardware is, well, to have all the hardware is impossible. There's no way we can have. We only have 1,100 square meters, so there is a limit in space we have. But we do collect all the computers that were of use in the Netherlands and related. Uh, but mostly what we do is collect the stories. The stories of the manufacturer. Why did the manufacturer decide to create this computer? What, want the, what did he want to do with it? Uh, what happened with this computer? Uh, what happened with the company because of this computer? Those are the interesting stories. But those are the interesting stories that you can find on the internet. Well, mostly. Sometimes we have to ask, and we, what we also do is contact people that actually work there and ask for that information because it's not available on the internet. Um, so we, if we find that information, and we are the guys that edit Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is full of errors. Uh, and we try to edit that, at least, and make it the, the correct way. And we also put that on our website so everybody can use this information. It's about sharing. In that way, maybe you also wonder what does a home computer museum have to do with, with an open source? Well, I like to think we are an open source museum because we are completely open in everything we do, as well as how we create the business, how we run the business at this moment, but also how we, do, uh, how we share everything. And um, even the big museums are now saying to us, we can learn a lot from you guys because we are so open in everything. We are, don't have any secrets at all. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm opening a computer museum or I want to open a museum, I'm going to help him. I don't care. Um, <coughs> Coming back to the stories, we do have the stories of the manufacturer, but then again you can have, you have them from the manufacturer itself, right? But I'm also interested in the collection of the people. Who were the people buying this computer? Why did they buy this computer? Why didn't they buy the other computer that was available? Maybe cheaper, maybe it's more expensive, I don't know. Uh, what happened because of this computer? And that's really interesting. And we can only reach that because we put all these setups over there. These are just pictures from the Home Computer Museum. Actually, they are, these are off for some reason, but um, normally these three computers are actually working and you can sit behind them. And we do a lot of effort in cre recreating the era of the computer, making sure this whole this feels entirely like it was back in the day when the computer was created. And we have the, the XD Sorcerer over there, which has a wallpaper from 1978, which was really hard to find, by the way. Uh, but also the the, the table, uh, the, the, the desk and the chair are also 78. We do a lot of doing just to make sure. And one of the stories of this XD Sorcerer um, is actually the, the founder of, uh, uh, I'll come back to you, um, the founder of uh, Tulip, who visited us a while ago. Uh, for the first time in 30 years, he was uh, seen in a museum, or at least knowing that he was doing something with computers again because he left the company and sold all his stock and the next day they put out a big loss. So yeah, it was not the best. Um, but um, yeah, he was, he was visiting us and um, this, this guy in his 70s now, um, he founded the, comput the computer company Tulip and he started out with CompuData. That was his first company. Um, and he saw their setup and he started to cry because it was completely filling him with memories, and that's what happens with us. We get these memories because all these settings are there, and they are working. You can sit behind them, and they're working. And you can feel it, you can touch it, and uh, you, can get you can get your memories back from seeing a picture. I'm sure some of you will recognize something. But it's getting much more stronger if you actually can sit on that same desk or and sit behind it, smell the computer, touch the computer, feel it, use the computer, and then you get this nostalgic feeling, and then you get the stories. And that's what we collect. We collect these stories. And we try to, to save these stories, and we put them in a big database right now. And uh, if people are uh, saying you can, you can share it, we will share it on our website, uh, if possible. But if not, we have still have a few stories we cannot share yet. Um, but um, yeah, we get these stories, and that's the most thing. And that's the most important thing we do in the home computer machine collecting stories. And yes, we need computers for that. So, uh, we have more. Oh, we have more settings. That's a slow one. 
Yeah, there you go. So this is, uh, these are more uh, of the setups we have. Um, as you can see, more of the computers are actually on, so this is um, more how it looks uh, today. Um, yeah, it's, it's just about memories. People getting memories, they see this and they are getting overwhelmed by the amount of computers. And uh, we have about 30 desks uh, set up uh, completely in this, uh, in this setup, like, like here the, the Commodore PET, or over there the uh, iMac, and over there the Philips P2000. And it just triggers people's memories and they start to share stories. And those are the interesting ones. Here we have a few more. And these are the more extreme computers we have, uh, like the Aesthetics which is uh, the very first, uh, one of the first design computers. It's actually a Dutch computer, and we are the only one in the entire world who have it working. We started to work on it in 2020, and currently we have the only one that is fully working, apart from the digitizer, the, the tablet is not working, so we are going to get the one from the Sound Division uh, Museum. They also have one, but they don't use it, so we just said, okay, we'll take it. Um, and this is, has a lot of Dutch history uh, behind it. Everybody knows here uh, Photoshop or Illustrator or something like that, or AutoCAD, right? Um, Adobe and AutoCAD as well saw this computer. And they created their menu system based on this computer. So it's not the other way around. This computer is from 1985, but the original one is from 1982. And, um, it is a very powerful computer, and it was built to uh, create the Amstel logo and the Heineken logo, but also Volvo had one, and Mercedes had one, and Volkswagen had one, um, Ford had one. I can name a lot of companies who use the computer like that. Even all the uh, traffic signs you can see outside right now, they are designed with an Aesthetics. And this one was completely lost. This story was completely gone. In 2018, when we picked it up, it was gone. I have a question first. <laughs> When is a computer history, or better said, when is it interesting for you, your museum? Um, the question is, uh, when is the computer interesting for the, for the museum? Uh, the computer is currently interesting is if, if it's before 2008, because that's where we end uh, at this moment. Uh, maybe in the future we'll, we'll continue much further, but yeah, we have to make an end date at some point. So everything before 2008. And um, a computer is interesting if we, well, first of all, if we don't have it, it's interesting. Uh, it has to be a home computer or related to a home computer, or it has to be a Dutch computer. Then it's interesting for us. And stories and storage, yeah. <laughs> Michael? Uh, yeah, regarding this uh, high value that you created, uh, what do you do to protect it against flooding and fire? Because with that storage you can go quickly. Yeah, Li living above sea level, that's a good one. Um, no, I mean, obviously we have insurance um, and uh, we power everything down in the, in the evening. So whenever we don't have visitors, everything is completely without power. There's literally no power on all the circuits we have the computers connected to. And uh, they, these are only on when there's somebody inside and we have camera uh, connection everywhere. We have monitoring on the power consumption. If you see uh, a big spike on power, then uh, we absolutely will uh, go check it out. Or if you smell something, we walk around in the museum a lot just to smell if something is burning. So. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a whole barn over there. That's a Dutch computer as well. And Tulip is a Dutch computer. And uh, the NASA property, that's actually the computer that was used at NASA. We have another question. Yeah, one more question. Uh, how do you protect it against visitors? As you said, a lot of computers can be used. How do you reset them uh, at the end of the day? I mean, lots of those computers, uh, if you want to reset them, then you need to format it, and then you need to use 20 years or something. Now, it's an interesting question. The question is uh, how we protect the computers from the users. Well, the interesting one, and that's what I always say to people, uh, they say, why are you not, not free? Well, because of that. Uh, people have to pay entrance to us, to visit us, 10 euro 24. I'm sure you get the joke. A lot of people ask why is this weird number, but 10 euro 24 is the entrance price. Um, um, and because we ask for entrance fee, it makes instantly value. People uh, pay for something and therefore they are not destroying it. And uh, we have actually proof for that because we opened in our entire history in the current location, uh, we opened one day for free for some kind of museum day. Well, 
And then you get people in that will try to dest destroy the computers because it's free and it's worthless. And it's really stupid. It's, it's something human, I guess. Uh, and of course, uh, we ask them nicely just, you know, it's old computers, it's real computers, just so please be careful with it. And uh, we don't allow, especially when younger children are coming, uh, please leave all the disks and items next to the computer because we already had a few times that disks were put in in very creative ways. Yeah. Yeah, and that, we don't like that, but we fix it anyway, so it's, uh, we have our own repair shop. What's the next? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a few things we have in the collection. Um, I'm not going to tell everything because you can read it, first of all, and second of all, you can also visit the museum because everything is actually in the museum, except for the Piracy Museum. So we get that uh, soon, hopefully. All the Twilights and uh, Crazy Bites and all that kind of... Uh, <laughs> stuff we get. Um, yeah, we have uh, some really un uh, unique things like the Amiga 4000 that was used for the movie Titanic, which actually we saved the hard disk we, uh, and we put it on archive.org, so you can actually find that hard disk on archive.org. Um, an Acorn system one, there's only nine of them existing today in the world. There used to be two in Europe, but England left, so there was one in Europe. Um, <laughs> We have the CDI development machine, we have the Q1 computer, which was uh, recently discovered that it was actually the first microcomputer. Um, everybody was thinking about the French computer, but uh, we found out this was from 1972. So this has an Intel 8008, and therefore it was the very first microcomputer ever created. Uh, we have the five Holborns out of the 200 ever made, and yeah, all models and all that kind of fun things. But wait, there's more. Yes, we have our own, uh, created our own dashboard we, uh, to manage everything. Um, we, f we try to find museum collection stuff and nothing would even come close to what we wanted to, to do with it, therefore we created our own. Uh, which are we actually going to try to make open source at some point? We actually want that. Um, so everybody can use this. Uh, it's a ticket. Uh, we have a system that uh, consists of all the computers we can have. We have several ways of uh, saving it. Uh, we can also have a ticket si system. So whenever we have a repair, we can connect it to a computer and uh, we can actually see the history of that particular repair and of that particular item, which is also required. Um, yeah, we also have uh, create our own beer because that's logic to do. Um, yeah, because we exist for five years, and so we created our own beer, which is called Retrobrite. I don't have it with me, but you can buy it in the museum. 8-bit. Uh, uh, we have the internet as well, for somebody. Yeah, some, some of them. <laughs> and uh, over there is uh, this, this uh, lady, uh, she's from the uh, Literature Museum, and that's also one of the things we do, and one of the unique things we do in... Um, in Europe, uh, we are able to read all media. Uh, remember disks, everybody knows floppy disks, right? And a three and a half inch di dry disk is easy. You can buy a USB disk reader, no problem. You can read it fine. But five and a quarter inch is a bit more challenging. And not talking about eight inch even, <laughs> that's even worse. And then you have SideQuest disks, uh, several, uh, you have tapes, uh, all that kind of fun things. And we can read everything because we have all these old media readers. And the best thing is we also have um, the computers working because all computers in the Home Computer Museum are working. So what we can do, and that's unique in Europe, is we can use your own floppy, we can put it in a similar computer that you used, use the original software to open that particular piece of data and then convert it from there. And very simple example, I come to you. A very simple example, uh, a WordPerfect 5.1. It was used a lot. And if you can, you can open it in Office 365, no problem. You can open it, you can open it in open Office as well. Um, no problem, but you will lose the layout because the current importer of WordPerfect files is gone. It's terrible. However, we still know that you can open it in Office 97 and, uh, open, and from there convert it to modern word, and that's, some, that's, that's the easy one. Uh, we're not talking about Quark Express, for example, because that's a hell to convert. Uh, first question there, and then go here. Yeah, do you have some kind of scheme to keep the old media readable because they deteriorate over time, and things get lost that way? Um, the question is if, if we uh, use a scheme to um, uh, 
make sure this, the, the, the media is preserved, basically you ask. Um, well, actually, the media is not the problem. The only thing that deteriorates over time are CDs. These are the only ones, and floppy disks, obviously, but if you store them cor incorrectly. But most, if you, if you have important data, you store them correctly. Uh, CDs are the, are the terrible ones. If you get a CD, that's CD rot. That, that just happens. I can't fix that. Um, hard disks are also uh, very bad to get, because a hard disk is the only one that has a rotating uh, inside. So the, en the, the motor will just burn out, and uh, there's no way we can rescue that data because we don't have the tools for that. But floppy disks, fine. We have enough, and we can repair all the floppy drives, and we have th thousands of floppy drive readers, so I'm sure we get one reading. And yeah, everything we can read, we actually store on, uh, we put on archive.org or whatever on our own uh, internal storage. And we also have uh, a download where you can download uh, disk images, for example, uh, which we found, like PC-DOS 1.0. <laughs> Um, we put there just for everybody to download, and uh, that's what we also do. And another question? Well, if you like, uh, there's WordPerfect 8.0 for Ubuntu Debian packages, simply uh, download and uh, that works. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It, 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 I said this was a simple qu the, the question. You can you can use basically any uh, WordPerfect file. You can just open. It's fine. That's the easy, com but it's easy to explain. I mean, I can also explain why Quark Express 1.0 you cannot open in Quark Express 2.0 <laughs> because there's no backwards compatibility between. Uh, so you need an old Mac just to run Quark Express 1.0, and then you can open it, <laughs> and then convert it to PDF, and then import it to another one, and then import it to Adobe, and then you can convert it to PDF or whatever the the, the customer wants in this case. So um, yeah, we do. Um, here are a few things we also have inside the museum. We have dial-up internet. You can actually dial-up on the internet inside the museum. Maybe in the future we actually go in outside as well, so you have a dial-up number in Helmond, where you can just dial in your modem if you want to. We have a BBS. We are actually the only one, again, uh, who restored Viditel, for those who know that. <laughs> we have it. <laughs> we have Viditel. Uh, and our own collection management uh, system. Um, yeah, between 200 and 300 computers are working every day. So you can use between 200 and 300 computers on a daily basis if you visit the museum. And you can visit, you can start visiting at 11 and you have to go by 6. So, uh, and trust me, um, especially if you like old computers or if you just are interested in it, uh, in one day you cannot see everything. We know, because we have the, an American guy who spent four days <laughs> in the museum. I still didn't see anything, everything. So what next? Oh yeah, right. Um, we also do um, yeah lectures and uh, tours. For example, um, uh, this work. Yeah, that, that guy. That guy is one of the key developers of CDI, and he did a lecture at the Home Computer Museum when CDI existed for uh, 30 years, or well, 31 years actually. Um, so we did that uh, CDI, and we have um, we do a lot of the lectures. We do um, tours as well. This is. Uh, also a lot of uh, CDI people, actually. Um, that's also one of the things we do. We do uh, business. Uh, you can visit us as business. We do give tours. We do for schools. We teach them. Um, and what we show for schools, for example, is uh, actually the history and make people, uh, especially young people, uh, see that what you have right now did come every, so from something. It didn't start like this. It started from the simple Pong. It started from a Commodore 64 where you have to wait for a long, long time. And it started with this, this Altair, which has programmed by, by buttons. And so we tell that story. And by the end of the, uh, the younger people is usually an hour or so. And by the end of the day, they are all already interested and they love to just read all the old stories because at that point, it's, it's fascination for this is really something special we have in our hands. So, um, yeah, user collection, that's what I said, cool. Um, so, our goal is basically, uh, we're interactive, um, and because of that, nostalgia, and from nostalgia comes memories, and from memories is suddenly this computer, which consists of plastic, metal, copper, and all the fun parts that are inside. It's just a piece, just an object, just a tool, and it suddenly becomes a piece of heritage. And that's what the Home Computer Museum does. So, um, 
I'll go uh, uh, much quicker to the social, commercial and knowledge part, because uh, the social part is also quite interesting for us. Um, as we, uh, as LGR already said, uh, we do have a lot of people with a distance to the labor market. Uh, most of them have a form of autism and we actually help them uh, to get back to work. Um, and we are effective in that. Uh, in 2022, we had uh, eight people going back to the labor market, finding a full-time job, starting out with, with us uh, without any knowledge or with, with knowledge of computers, but without uh, technical, uh, without social skills, and um, without any, uh, they forgot how to work, how work works. Uh, be on time, make sure you have lunch with you, uh, listen to something, listen to your boss, listen, uh, find your own uh, work instead of asking for work. Uh, those kind of basic things people forget, uh, especially who are longer um, not in, in the work environment. And that's what we learn. And we do that uh, in 2022, we put eight people back to the labor market. In 2023, so far, we have put three people back to the labor market. And the best part is, those people also remain volunteer at the Home Computer Museum, even though they have a full-time job right now. Because the Home Computer Museum, everybody is a volunteer. We don't have any weird, okay, you have autism, so you have a reintegration, or you have daycare, uh, daytime activities, or you're an intern, I don't care. You're a volunteer. That's it. And everybody is the same. And uh, therefore, everybody sees that it's a big family, basically. It's a family company that <coughs> has different parents. And uh, that's what we, uh, one of the things we do. And that's also what makes the Home Computer Museum unique. And any volunteer at the museum can ask what's the current status of the uh, bank account on the, of the museum, and I will tell them, because I don't have any secrets of them. Because I treat them as an equal. If they have an idea of the Home Computer Museum, I will listen. The entire board will listen and will we'll act to it, if possible. So that's um, the social, and yeah, how we do this? Now, this is um, the current uh, income we have. Most of you are Dutch, so you know. You know. Um, as you can see, we only received 21% of subsidy, and that's this year. Uh, next year, currently, there's $75,000 um, reserved for us, but it's unsure if we ever get it. Probably we get it, hopefully. But uh, yeah, we are not dependent on um, on this alone. We're not dependent on subsidy alone. We are not dependent on one thing alone, and that's the whole key of we have this pillar system. We are not dependent on one particular item. We are not dependent on one money source. We can just stay in business forever as long as we keep on doing what we are doing. And it's even independent of me. I can die tomorrow or tonight, whatever. Um, not planning to, but I can. Um, but the museum will continue. And that's, I think, the best thing I could have done. Make sure this museum will continue forever. And make sure this history will always be told. We have a question? How do you triple ticket uh, sales? In the hmm? How do you triple ticket sales? In the ticket sales. Um, it's there. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we have, uh, it, it's expected because this was made in, I think, November, early November or so. Uh, we have to do two months and we didn't know what to, was going to happen. So, so, um, so uh, I told you about the digital heritage. Uh, well, these are just some examples of digital heritage we do. And if people are like the hunted, ever seen somebody? Well. That was us. <laughs> That's me on Hunted. We didn't know anything about it. They literally called us, uh, can we read the disc from you? Sure. And next day they were there suddenly with the camera. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, which, uh, which was a very good commercial for us because uh, it was free. <laughs> uh, and this was actually the winners uh, who are not the nice people. Nice, the, who are not the nicest people. They actually got into a fight at the Home Computer Museum, which was not on television, but... <laughs> Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, uh, this is one of the computers we use. This is actually a Windows, uh, I think, in 198 at this moment, and we needed to have arcade backup just to read uh, a DDS. It was a particular way of saving, and we could read the DDS tape back using this software, and then we could get the files from there. So that's something you don't 
do on Windows 11 or Windows 11, uh, 10 or even with Wine under Linux. You just can't fit, get it out. So you need a Windows 98 for that, preferably. Um, last thing um, is uh, we also sell overstock because we only have 1,100 square meters, well, 1,090, and therefore we keep uh, we have a collection plan stating we have four, uh, three of each, one in the museum, one in the warehouse, and one in the box, and the fourth one that's uh, being donated to us, and we get a lot donated. Uh, we're talking about six to ten computers on average a week. <laughs> Uh, coming in through the door, just being donated, and we can't keep it all. It's, it is ridiculous to keep all computers because we don't. We are not collectors. We're a computer museum. We're not a computer collector, and um, we collect the stories, but stories don't take much space. Um, computers do, and therefore we select only three, the the three best, and one should be in the box. The fourth one coming in will be sold. We put out to. Um, just to marketplace on, uh, and people just can just come along, uh, buy it, and make an offer. It's always make an offer. We never put a price on it, just make an offer, and if we agree to this, that offer, if we think it's a reasonable offer, then sure, you can keep it. And you can buy it for that point. But if we know that somebody's buying a computer from us and then reselling it uh, for a bigger price, then we won't sell it. Because I'm okay with people making money, but not on the back of the home computer museum. Um, so this is a few of the shop uh, things. This is actually a donation on top of there, uh, that one. That's a donation from um, Belgium, which we picked up. 75 computers. We had to drive there with uh, two trucks and three cars, and we didn't pick anything. There's also a video on YouTube on that. What's the blue one there? Like that, that's a heat kit uh, computer. That's uh, just a heat kit H8, I think. That one? Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a heat kit computer. Yeah, it's in the, 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 the original ones just to, to program, to learn how to program. Very early computer stuff. Um, so that's the Home Computer Museum, in short, basically. Um, yeah, these are just pictures of us. Um, if you uh, are in the neighborhood of Helmond, or not, and you can drive there, um, Make sure to visit us. We're open five days a week from Wednesday to Sunday, 11 to 6. Uh, we have uh, between 200 and 300 computers are working, and you can have uh, all the fun. Um, yeah, this is what people think of us. As you can see, we do a lot of uh, Google reviews, which is already old because it's 4.9 now. Um, we won several prizes and all the great things. Um, and these are our collaboration partners, because we love to collaborate with everybody who is even considering to collaborate with us, uh, including um, people like uh, the uh, Duff Museum. If you go to the Duff Museum, if you like old cars, uh, go to the Duff Museum. There's also a computer over there from us. If you go to the Steendruck Museum in uh, Valkenswaard, there's computers from us standing there. If you go to... Um, where is it? Uh, the Sound Division in uh, Hilversum, there are computers of us. Uh, so we do collaborate a lot uh, with, uh, we, hire people, uh, we hire computers from, uh, to, um, to television, uh, NPO, uh, Omroep Brabant. Uh, we're collaborating with universities a lot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just way too much, and I, I can't tell this anymore in 45 minutes. But, uh, so if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to ask. What are you doing on OnlyFans? Sorry? What are you doing on OnlyFans? On OnlyFans? <laughs> Putting on fans. <laughs> it's OnlyFans, so we put pictures of fans over there. <laughs> Because that's what we do. <laughs> only fans. I mean, it's it's called like that. I don't understand all the naked people. Only fans. Okay, fans. <laughs> we actually are an account, so you can follow. We only have one follower, by the way. So almost. <laughs> A quarter of your income is uh, from uh, What does that do? Um, that's people with uh, usually uh, some kind of uh, handicap. It could be uh, like autism, it could be a physical handicap or something like that. And uh, in order to make them um, do something uh, during the day, make something uh, of their life, uh, adding something to some 
uh, yeah, company like a museum, for example, uh, you get paid for that. And therefore, it's kind of subsidized, but you have to work for it. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thanks a lot. I still have two minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, can, you can take the two minutes. <laughs> According to this clock, I did uh, one minute. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Great, uh, great to see all the uh, artifacts of uh, previous lives. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome.